All right, here we are. Going to be a sermon today on logic versus emotion. Now, you want to turn in your Bible here to start out. We're going to go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. And you're going to need your King James Bible today. This is a sermon recording, so I'm not going to put up the scriptures for you. You're going to have to look this stuff up on your on your own. But um, <clears throat> going to be trying to do a weekly sermon here and. Uh, they're just going to be recorded, just rough recording, no real editing or anything else, unless I really mess up, which can happen at times. But uh, we're going to be doing these sermons out here in nature, and uh, just like a lot of the early Christians would have done. That's the purpose of this. But today, like I said, we're going to talk about logic versus emotion. We're going to start out here in Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Now, as I talk about logic today, I don't want you, the viewer, to get off into the studies of logic and to get into reasoning and all this other stuff because some of it can get downright pagan and can take you away from the Bible because I'm going to show you logic is good, but it has its flaws, okay? The only one who can truly practice true logic is somebody who has absolute understanding of everything on the planet. All right, there are, there are limits to logic, in other words. Logical reasoning, there are limits to it. And uh, <clears throat> just in case you're wondering, I do have sermon notes. I've had people comment about that, that it's not real preaching because I write things down. Well, sorry to tell you, but real preaching is based on Scripture. It's not based on me up here reading one verse of Scripture and then ranting and raving for the next half hour or an hour. Okay, real preaching is Scripture with Scripture. Right, that's what it's about. All right, so that's why I write things down because I want to be organized. Okay, Paul wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He said that all things be done decently and in order. Real preaching is not just shooting your mouth off. Okay. So, now we're going to just do a basic study here on the subject of logic. Right? There's a lot more to it, a lot more technicalities and things, but I want to talk about the three basic types of logical reasoning. Okay, first of all, you have deductive reasoning. Secondly, you have inductive reasoning. Thirdly, you have abductive reasoning. I'm going to give you just a quick example of what each one of those uh, is, how to define it. Deductive reasoning is basically you start out with an absolute statement and then you deduce things from that. I'll give you an example. All men die. Is that an absolute standard? Yeah. In 6,000 years of, of the history of man, there's never been one exception to that. Okay? Unless you're talking about Bible characters. You know, Enoch didn't die, Elijah didn't die, you know, Jesus Christ died but rose again from the dead and went up to heaven. But I'm talking about the average man, unless there's supernatural intervention, every man dies at some point in time. Okay? All men die. The second part of that, Brian is a man. So what can we deduce from that? Brian will one day die. Right? All men die. Brian's a man. Brian's going to die. And that applies to all of you out there, too. Every man watching this right now, and you're either a man or a woman, you know, womb man, you're all going to die. Every man dies. Okay? Is that logical? Yes. And it doesn't matter how much emotion you have, how much you say, well, I don't want to die, and I, I don't feel that that's right, and I don't, it uh, doesn't matter. You're going to die one day. Okay? That's deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is not quite as scientific. It's just dealing with the information that you have before you. Okay? I'll give you an example. This bird is a swan. You're driving someplace, you see a bird, you say, that's a swan. The swan is white. Therefore, you reason, logically reason, all swans are white. With the limited amount of information that you have been given, you can logically reason, there's a swan, he's white, he or she is white, therefore all swans must be white. Okay. Now see, that's what most people do with reasoning and things because we don't have absolute knowledge. The problem is you're driving along someday and there's a bunch of swans there, white swans, and there's a black one among them. Well, now the exception has overthrown the rule. So inductive reasoning is not quite as good as deductive reasoning. The third type, abductive reasoning. 
and this would be used a lot at crime scenes and things like this. I'll give you a couple examples. Start out. The jar is filled with coins. There's a jar sitting there, it's filled with coins, okay? A man standing there named Bill, Bill has a coin in his hand. Therefore, you can reason, Bill probably got that coin from that jar. Now, Bill might not have gotten the, the coin from the jar, but you can abductively reason, logically reason, he probably got it because there's the jar of coins. He probably got that coin in his hand from the jar, right? Yeah, that would seem reasonable. I'll give you another example. There's an apartment building, okay? There's a murder, murder in the apartment building. There's a man named Sam in the apartment building at the time of the murder. Sam is a suspect. Is that logical? Sure, absolutely. But see, it wouldn't be logical to say this apartment building where the murder happened is in New York City, but I believe somebody in Beijing, China did the murder. No, that wouldn't be logically reasoning. Okay, you'd look at who was in the building at the time that the murder occurred. That's abductive reasoning. Okay, now was it Sam? Maybe, maybe not. Okay, but logically reasoning, you say, well, it could have been him. See, this is logic, all right? And I like to kind of call it, I mean, a lot of the stuff is, you know, kind of overcomplicated. In reality, logical reasoning is just common sense. That's what it really is. And when you have people interjecting emotion, it's because they have abandoned logical reasoning. And unfortunately, there's an awful lot of emotion and not logical reasoning when it comes to religion and religious type practices. We're going to go over some of those today and I'm going to show you that the King James Bible is a very logical book. The King James Bible has a lot of logic in it that a lot of professing Christians totally try to get rid of because of their emotions. We're going to look at that in this study. But uh, I want to read here Webster's 1828 Dictionary uh, definition for the word logic. Logic. Uh, noun. It's from the uh, Greek from reason to speak. The art of thinking and reasoning justly. Logic is the art of using reason well in our iniquities. Or, I'm sorry. In, logic is the art of using reason well in our inquiries after truth and the communication of it to others. Hmm. Logic may de be defined the science or history of the human mind as it traces the progress of our knowledge from our first conceptions through their different combinations and the numerous deductions from that result from comparing them with one another. Correct reasoning implies correct thinking and legitimate inferences from premises which are principles assumed or admitted to be just. Logic then includes the art of thinking as well as the art of reasoning. The purpose of logic is to direct the intellectual powers in the investigation of truth and in the communication of it to others. Very good definition of the word logic, okay? And the Bible claims to be absolute truth. I'm going to show you about, about that in a little bit here. Well, let's start out here. We'll go to Proverbs chapter 1 in your King James Bible. Proverbs chapter 1. I'm going to start at verse 1. Proverbs chapter 1, 1 through 9. It says here, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. Okay? I don't care what your professor says, he was the wisest man. Okay? Solomon, not your professor, even though he might think so. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. That sounds like logical reasoning to me, doesn't it? Yeah, perceiving the words of understanding. That's what that would be. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. To give subtly to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Remember what we read there in Webster's 1828 Dictionary? It's the understanding of truth and the committing of it to others. Yeah. Why do you think Solomon wrote these different books in the Bible? To communicate his wisdom to other people. Verse 5, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. Wisdom starts with fearing God. That's just the simple way that, that it is. You say, well, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God. Well, then you'll never be wise. It's just as simple as that. Okay, to deny God is completely unscientific. All right, you have to deny a lot of facts that are right before your face. Most of what you're right here before you in this video, right here behind me, all this stuff happened by chance. These birds singing in the trees, that all happened by chance. You gotta be crazy to believe that in reality. No, the reason men reject God is because they don't like it because God judges sin in his book. God says you're a sinner and you're on your way to hell. That's why men reject God and specifically so Jesus Christ. Okay, there's no other reason to reject God, the existence of God, all right? This is intelligent design out here like you wouldn't believe. Study nature sometime, okay? The invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You have no excuse if you deny God, the existence of God. But, let's go next to Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah 28 in your Bible. Isaiah chapter 28 verses 9 through 11. It says here, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts. In other words, you're not a baby anymore. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, for with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. Okay? Right here is how you learn wisdom and instruction and understanding, line upon line. You know why a lot of people reject this book? Because they don't study it line upon line. They'll look, go through this book looking for a contradiction. And a lot of times these contradictions, every time these contradictions can easily be explained by the context in which the verses appear. They'll say, you know, there are multiple accounts of, of what was written above Jesus on the cross. Ha, 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 contradiction. Well, if you were actually saved and not spiritually dead, you'd be able to actually go through the Bible and see where it says, at, in a couple different verses actually, I believe it is, I think it's in Luke, where it talks about that there are three languages, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, representing the three races. And those three languages were what was written above Jesus' head. So there aren't three different contradicting accounts there's three different languages. And if you know anything at all about language, you know that they aren't word for word similar to the others. See, what's the problem? People are going through the Bible looking for contradictions. They aren't comparing it line upon line, precept upon precept. They don't come to the Bible logically. They are not coming to it and reasoning logically. They're coming to it out of their emotions because the King James Bible says, you're a sinner. And that makes people emotional. People get upset. Their feelings get hurt. So they reject the book. Now what's interesting too, it said there in verse 9, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breasts. What is that? What's described there? A baby. Now what controls a baby? Logical reasoning or emotion? Emotion. Right? Yeah. A baby is controlled by emotion. So, if you are controlled by emotion, and I've hurt your feelings already, you're a baby. You're immature, according to the Bible. But let's look at Webster's 1828 Dictionary definition of the word emotion. Literally, a moving of the mind or soul, hence any agitation of mind or excitement of sensibility. In a philosophical sense, an internal motion or agitation of the mind which passes away without desire, 
when desire follows, the motion or agitation is called a passion. Passion is the sensible effect, the feeling to which the mind is subjected when an object of importance suddenly and imperiously demands its, at its attention. The state of absolute passiveness in consequence of any sudden percussion of mind is of short duration. The strong impression or vivid sensation immediately produces a reaction correspondent to its nature, either to appropriate and enjoy to or avoid and repel the exciting cause, this reaction is very properly distinguished by the term emotion. Emotions, therefore, now get this, according to the genuine signification of the word, are principally and primarily applicable to the sensible changes and visible effects which particular passion, passions produce on the frame in consequence of this reaction or particular agitation of mind. In other words, emotions are based on feelings and sight. That is what emotion is based on. It's not logical reasoning. You see something happening and you react out of feeling, you react out of sight, instead of logically reasoning, what's going on here? See, that's the difference. And I want to show you some good cases of this. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Turn in your New Testament there. First Corinthians chapter 14. A little uh, cat birds having a good time up here. First Corinthians chapter 14 verse 20. Now remember, remember, those who react out of emotion, the Bible calls them babies, compares them to babies. Look what Paul says here to these Corinthians, these very, very carnal believers. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Paul is referring back to what we just read there in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11. That's what he's referring back to. But look what he says there. He says, be not children in understanding. Logically reason this thing out. He's talking to them about, he's rebuking them because they're, they're just disorganized and everybody's doing their own thing and their meetings and stuff and it's causing the word of God to be blasphemed. Okay, the lost are making fun of them because they're doing such weird things. All right, like a lot of the charismatic churches do today. And Paul is saying, logically reason this stuff out. Okay, and he's talking to them about speaking in tongues and and unknown tongues and the interpretation and all that other stuff. He's saying, reason this thing out like men. Okay, don't be a child in understanding. But he says, look, he says there, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. In other words, if you want to act like a little baby, if you want to prove the fact that you're immature as a Christian, then go ahead, act like a little baby. That's what he's saying. In malice be ye children. And you know what? Some of you out there that are modern Christians, in malice, be ye children. Go ahead. But in understanding, try to be a man, okay? Try to act grown up. That's just the way it is. Now let's turn to Proverbs chapter 9. Back to the Old Testament, Proverbs chapter 9. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7. Now remember, Paul was reproving, rebuking the Corinthian believers because they were carnal. Look here, it says, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7. He that reproveth a scorner getteth to himself shame, and he that rebuketh a wicked man getteth himself a blot. Not because you're speaking the truth to them, but because that's what they'll put on you. Verse 8, Reprove not a scorner, lest he hate thee. Now watch the contrast. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love thee. Somebody who's wise. Why? Because they're not thinking with emotion. It's logical reasoning. You rebuke, I've had people rebuke me, and I look at the scriptures that they give me, and I go, oh boy, you know, I did say that, and oh man, I was wrong on that. I will logically reason it out. Sometimes I react right away with emotion. I get angry. 
but I tried to logically reason things out. Okay, I tried to be a man in understanding, not a child. Okay, in malice. Continuing here, verse 9. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. For by me thy days shall be multiplied, and the years of thy life shall be increased. If thou be wise, thou shalt be wise for thyself, but if thou scornest, thou alone shalt bear it. Hmm. Do you want to be wise in this life? Or do you just want to be a scorner and not let anybody rebuke you? Do you want to go through this life emotionally? Would it help if you look here behind me? If I wanted to make it up to the top of this ridge over here, over there, if I wanted to make it up to the top of that, would it be better for me to be blindfolded or have my eyes uncovered? Obviously, if I had my eyes blindfolded and I tried to make it down this hill and up that other ridge, I probably would have a rather tough time of it. Especially when I get down to the road. You know, not too good. You want to be able to see, okay? You don't want to feel your way over to there. And brother, sister, you don't want to feel your way through this life. You want to be able to see through the lens of God's Word. Don't wander through life with your feelings and your emotions. Base your life on absolute truth and the standard of God's Word. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Jesus ever use logic with his disciples? Or was he just all emotion and I love you and I love people and I just love this and I just love that? Or did he use logic? Turn to Luke chapter 12 in your Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Luke chapter 12. We're going to go to verse 22. Luke 12 and verse 22. This is going to be interesting for you today too because of where the uh, backdrop here. Luke chapter 12, verse 22 says, And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens. I don't see any ravens right now out here, but there are plenty of other birds. For they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you with taking thought can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then be not able to do that, which, that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothe the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth what, that ye have need of these things. Oh, well then, praise the Lord, I don't have to work for a living, and I don't ever have to make any kind of money or anything. That's not what's being said there, okay? What is being said there is, when you start to doubt, and you start to say, God can't take care of me and you start to get all kinds of insurance policies to make sure that you're safe in life because you start to doubt that God can take care of you and you start to have all kinds of worries and all kinds of doubts and I've got to save up this and I've got to save up that and everything else. God takes care of these birds out here that are flying around. He doesn't say to the birds, hey, you know, you better go down to the local McDonald's and get a job or you better go down to the factory and get a job or you better become an electrician or something like that. Uh -uh. And if God does that for the birds, don't you think He'll take care of you? Don't you think God will get you a, a decent job or an income of some kind, depending on what you're doing with your life? Don't you think God can do that if you put Him first? If you're doing His work and doing in His will? But you see, we get scared, don't we? We start to forsake trusting in the Lord and we start to say, what if this would happen and what if that would happen and Oh, oh, and you start to get worried. Almost like you're relying on emotion instead of logical reasoning. I mean, 
the God who put all this together, don't you think he could take care of you? Don't you think he knows what you're doing? Don't you think he watches over you? Why are you afraid? Because of emotion. Jesus is teaching his disciples, hey, you see all this complexity in nature? I can take care of you. Don't worry about it. I'll take care of you. And Christian, let me tell you something. There's a lot of things dispensationally. Jesus was there and there, they were, the kingdom was being presented to the Jews and everything else. I understand that. And the Bible says there back in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that if any provide not for his own, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. I understand that. You are to provide for your own. The Bible says another place there, I think it's 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, I think it is, where he says about if any would not work, neither should he eat. You know, I understand that. I understand all that. But the fact of the matter is, God can take care of you if you're doing his work. And I know a lot of brethren out there are getting real stressed out because things are getting real bad and the workplace is out there. You know, it's getting bad. You're being told you can't witness on the work site, you can't do this and you can't do that. We're heading into some bad times. And if you respond out of emotion, you're going to conform to the world. And you're going to do what the world tells you to do. And a lot of the brethren out there, when persecution comes, they're going to start, try to reason in their minds, not logically, but emotionally. They're going to get scared and they're going to say, God can't take care of us. God can't take care I have to compromise. I can't speak against sodomy anymore. I can't speak against Roman Catholicism. I can't speak against whatever. And they're going to go along with the system. Why? Because they forsook the Lord. They did not logically reason. They didn't look around and say, God can take care of all this. Certainly he can take care of me. That's the lesson that you need to learn from that portion there in the Bible. God will take care of you if you're doing right. And by the way, you say, but what if they kill me? What if they come and put me in prison? Uh, that's what they did to the Christians in the first century. And God still took care of them. You know, read the book of Acts. Jesus busted the disciples out of jail a couple times. Paul, a couple times they were coming after him, and the disciples and the other Christians got Paul out of there. And he escaped the hands of the men that were trying to hurt him. The Lord will take care of you. Unless you forsake him and start to respond out of emotion. Now, did anybody ever react to Jesus with emotion instead of logic? Was anybody ever emotional around Jesus and got mad at him? If you know your Bible, you know, probably have an idea where I'm going with this one. Turn to John chapter 10. One book over, John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 30 through 42. We'll read that quick. Here Jesus is dealing with the religious leaders of his days, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, all those guys that were always after him, you know, always coming after him. Look what it says here, John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of, these, of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Now just hold on for a second there. Jesus says, logically speaking here, which of the good works are you stoning me for? I mean, don't you think you'd be a little bit convinced that this guy's not just an average man? He's causing blind people to see. He's raising the dead, you know, back to life, like he did with Lazarus. He's causing the maimed to be whole. Here's some guy without a leg, and Jesus goes over and says, be healed. Touches his leg, and boom, a new leg grows. Don't you think that they would have said, this guy has to be God manifest in the flesh? I mean, supernatural signs coming, and the Jews require a sign. I mean, you know, there's no reason why they shouldn't have accepted him. But what did they say? They said, for blasphemy, we're going to stone you. Not for the good works, but for blasphemy. But who else but God in the flesh could have done the works that Jesus Christ was doing? It wasn't blasphemy. He was speaking the truth. But they were responding not out of logic. They didn't reason logically. See, if they were logically reasoning, deductive reasoning there, they could have looked at Jesus and they could have said, 
He just healed a blind man. Only God can make somebody have sight. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he must be God. That's logical reasoning. But they didn't respond out of logical reasoning. They responded out of their emotions. They didn't like this man. So it didn't matter what Jesus Christ did in front of them. It didn't matter how many miracles he did. They responded out of emotion. Let's continue here. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? I do, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. They were emotional. Even though Jesus tried to logically reason with these people, they were still emotional. Verse 40, And went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him, and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. So you see, they didn't all respond out of emotion. Some were actually logically reasoning, this guy, the works he's doing, he can't be anybody else but God. See, some people did respond out of logical reasoning. They logically deduced that this guy has to be God. I mean, if some guy showed up and he's doing all these miracles that Jesus Christ did back here in the first century, I'd say, well, there's a good chance this guy's God. But all these charismatic healers and all these false Christs and stuff, all that they can do out there is just fake things. I've never seen one faith healer, I've never seen one really truly restore somebody who was blind, born blind. I've never seen somebody, one of these faith healers, raise a dead man that had been dead for three days. Yeah, I'd like to see that. Real, really, really see that. Go down to a hospital and show it to me. Here's some guy that was over in Iraq or Afghanistan, he has legs blown off. He's laying there, you know, or sitting in his wheelchair, and a guy goes over and says, be healed, friend. Touches those stumps of his legs, and boom, legs grow. I'd be mightily convinced that guy was probably God, manifest in the flesh. Why? Because no man could do a thing like that. I would logically reason it out. It wouldn't be emotion. I'd say, hey, one plus one equals two here. I mean, this guy's doing these things. You can't do that if you're just a man. It's incredible. But let's look at some examples now of logic versus emotion. Turn first in your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Now, I've been in this battle for a long time as a Bible-believing preacher. I know how you get attacked if you're a Bible believer, because it's happened to me plenty of times. So I'm going to show you some examples. I'm going to do a little acting for you. I'm going to show you some examples of people responding out of emotion and not logic. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Okay, it says here, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, old things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. Okay, is that a logical statement? Yes. Let's break it down with deductive reasoning. If any man be in Christ, okay, if a man's in Christ. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things are become new. Now, does that make sense? Can you logically reason that thing out? Well, sure. If somebody truly gets saved, there ought to be a change. You know? Well, I got saved, but, uh, you know, I still smoke. Oh, that, that uh, prostitute there, yeah, I was with her last night, and I gotta head into the liquor store here and buy a couple cases of vodka or something for a party I'm gonna be throwing this weekend and all these earrings here and and uh <clears throat> yeah that <clears throat> that that my breath there yet yeah, smells a little bit of marijuana, but oh, I'm a Christian. Excuse me. And there are people that, you know, okay, you say, oh this guy just got saved, he's carnal, he's having a hard time. Yeah, whatever. I know the arguments. But the fact is, you have people that are 
saved for years and years and years, and they look like the world, they act like the world, they talk like the world, they think like the world, they're not Christians. I don't care what their profession is. They're not saved if there's no change in their lives. This is logical reasoning. You see some guy that was a drunk, a fighter, a fornicator, or whatever else, he gets saved and he changes. Cleans his life up. Totally changes his whole life. That guy's saved. Okay, why? Because the Bible says so. That's logically reasoning the thing out. But let me show you how emotion works. So you're saying then that I have to be perfect in order to be saved. Is that what you're saying? Who are you to judge me? I mean, who do you think you are? I'm trying my very best to be a Christian and you are trying to put all these legalistic standards on me. Who do you think you are? Don't you know, don't you know how I feel about Jesus? Don't you know how, how much I know he loves me? Even where I am right now in my life. And blah, 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 blah. Yeah. See, how many of you out there have gotten that from people? You try to tell them what the Bible says, and they'll do that. They'll pull that thing. Who are you to judge me? Don't you know how I feel? What are they doing? They're responding emotionally, not with logical reasoning. Remember the Bible talked about earlier about rebuking a scorner, and the scorner hates you, but you rebuke a wise man, and he goes, Huh. Thank you. Thank you for telling me that. See, that's a wise man's reaction. A person who's lost, who's just come to Lord out of emotion. They went to some big service and the people were, oh, you know, singing the music and everything else and, and it was all this emotional thing and, and the preacher's up there going, if you want to get saved today, come forward to this old-fashioned altar and give your life to Christ. And they get all tied up in the emotion. They go, oh, I want to get saved. And they pray some prayer and then they think they're in. It doesn't work that way. Okay? Logically, you have to reason, I'm a sinner. I deserve to go to hell. I should go to hell. And my only hope is the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's it. And you go and you get saved and you put your faith in the written record. Okay? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And you look at this book and you say, I need to change my life according to the scriptures. That's how the thing works. Okay, John 17, 17. How does this sanctification, this sanctifying work come about? Okay, you get saved, what happens? How do you get sanctified? Well, you need an absolute standard of truth. And what is that absolute standard of truth according to the Bible? You ought to know this verse. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So where's the logic? A Christian that's truly saved should be sanctified from the lost world. Or they should be set apart. They should be different from the lost world. Sanctification requires a standard of absolute truth. You can't just say, well, my sanctification is different than your sanctification. That's not a standard. Sanctification requires a, a standard of truth. What's the Bible say? Thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. Okay? But now, what's the emotional way to handle this thing? Well, who are you to judge me? I mean, how can you really say that this King James Bible is perfect? I mean, after all, we know that no, no translation can be inspired. So, I mean, I believe that the message of the words are inspired, but not every word in particular. And, and I mean, after all, there's a lot of things that were going on in the first century that aren't going on today, and, and therefore we can't really judge, you know, what, what we're supposed to live like. And I mean, I mean, uh, see how it goes? How many of you have heard that? Well, things have changed. Things are different now. Yeah, they are. They're a lot worse. Go next to John chapter 1. See, my battery's starting to run out. I'm going to have to hurry here. Don't exactly have electric up here. Although there are power lines over here, but I can't tie into those. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Okay? Absolute standard. 
Where's the logic at? Number one, God existed in the beginning. Okay, you see that there. The Word was God. The Word created everything. Now, who's the Word in the Bible? Jesus Christ. Capital W. There are seven references in your King James Bible to the capital W Word of God. That's the, the manifest Word of God. Okay? Seven references in your King James Bible. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. But what about emotion? How would you emotionally look at this world? Well, the evolutionist comes out here and he says, I don't know if we should be so dogmatic about it. I mean, because after all, this could have happened by chance. And who are you to force your religion down my throat? After all, I mean, we shouldn't look at this world religiously. We should look at it scientifically. And there, therefore, I mean, things could have happened by random chance. And, and, and I don't think we should have these dogmatic standards of right and wrong and sin and judgment and, and heaven and hell and, and God and the devil. And, you know, I, see? They come out here and they look at this emotionally. Logic dictates that you come out and you see the creation, you say there must be a creator. All right? Unless there's an emotional reason why you don't want to accept the idea of an all-powerful, all-knowing creator. Then you deny the truth. Then you come out and say, well, maybe there isn't a God. Maybe there's, you know, it just happened by chance. Because I don't want to be judged someday by a perfect creator. See, you can come out here and you can look at this emotionally. You can start digging in the dirt down there, trying to look for bones or any kind of proof to disprove the fact that there is a God. Like most of the science, you know, scientific community does today. Oppositions of science falsely so-called, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. Yeah. The Bible's got your number. You can't escape from it. How about Luke chapter 16? Luke chapter 16, we'll look at another example of logic here. And this is a good one. Luke chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Hmm. So what do we see logically here? How can we logically reason this thing out? Service to God is enmity with the lost world. If you're going to serve God in this life, you are not going to get along with the world. It's as simple as that. The lost world hates God. They respond emotionally to the existence of God. They don't like the thought of an all-powerful being. That's why you cannot serve God and mammon. Absolute truth. That's a standard. Second part, serving the world brings riches. Okay? You serve God, it makes the world mad at you. You serve the world, it will bring riches. So then what can we conclude by that? Highly esteemed people in this life, in this world, are God's enemies. Period. It says back in James 4, 4 that the friend of the world is the enemy of God. Oh, but let's look at this thing emotionally for uh, a second here. I, I mean, because really, I mean, can't why can't we be like the lost world to win the lost? Can't we have a good, profitable business? Can't I be a multi-millionaire and still serve Jesus Christ? After all, if I love Jesus Christ, I can still go out and cut people's throats in business and, and, and make lots of money and compromise the truth because after all, I could make a lot of money and that could go to serve a lot of churches and things. And, and, and after all, if I had lots of money, think of all I could do for the Lord. I mean, you know, I could have a big house and I could invite lots of people over and, 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 and we could really be a good help to a lot of people if I had lots of money. Well, then the Bible's not true. You see? You cannot overthrow logical reasoning and scripture with your emotions. You can't do it. You cannot serve God and mammon. That's all there is to it. But isn't there a loophole? No! There is no loophole. That's the way it's going to be.
unless you have some secret little thing that you know that Jesus Christ didn't figure out when he was here on the earth. Yeah, sure you do. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. And there's tons of these things too I could go through, but we're not going to go through everything here. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Here's another good one. This is going to get some of the brethren upset. Truth always does. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 12 through 13. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall be popular in the world. It doesn't say that. You need to be following along in your King James Bible to make sure I'm not lying to you. It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Have you been persecuted as a Bible-believing Christian? Mm -hmm. I've never met one that hasn't been persecuted by somebody. Family, friends, co-workers, people that they live around, wherever. People here on YouTube, people on the internet, you're going to be persecuted. Why? That which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. You can't get away from it. Absolute truth. Logically, you can reason this thing out. Let's continue, though. Verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, what is the logic there? Real Christians will always be despised and persecuted. Right? Evil and deception will get worse. Second law of thermodynamics. The Bible is truly in line with science. The law of entropy. The law of things falling apart. That's what your King James Bible teaches. The Christian church, therefore, is not headed for revival. But, but, Brother Brian, what if we pray? What if we turn from our wickedness? What if, what if we as a people cry out to God and say, God, heal our land? Oh, please, Lord, we'll turn back to the Bible and we'll bring the Constitution back and we'll have two cars in every lane and a house that's paid for and a swimming pool in the backyard and we'll have the, the gold and silver currency back in the... Yeah, uh-huh. Just go on living in your pipe dream. It's not going to happen. Okay? If we have massive revival in this country, the Bible's a lie. The Bible's not true. But you see, a lot of you out there, a lot of you dumb thumps, you go to some church building somewhere where the guy's trying to fill the pews because then he'll make more money and the bills won't be as bad and everything else, and he's going to preach to you that there could be revival. If you people get out there and you preach the word and you go out door to door and you get people in here, get them saved, brother, we can bring revival. No, you can't. No, you cannot. And if you are sitting under a ministry or if you have anything to do with a ministry that's preaching revival, you're not a Bible believer. Truth. Absolute truth. Like it or lump it. Just as simple as that. So then how should we as Christians live today? Logically or emotionally? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. And I really got to hurry because I see my battery is just about dead. Flee also youthful lusts. Don't be a child. You know, how be it in malice, be, it, be children. Okay, but in understanding, be men. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Don't be conformed and don't have your mind made up by sight, feelings, smell, hearing, the emotions. Logically reason things. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid knowing that they do gender strifes. Mm -hmm. Avoid questions that are not logical. Okay, People that are just trying to start arguments, people that are just trying to be a pain. I'll give you a couple of examples. Are you saying that my NIV is going to send me to hell? That's a stupid question. Okay, Avoid that kind of nonsense. I'll give you another one. Where in the Bible does it say that I cannot watch any television? That's another stupid question. How about, didn't Jesus have long hair and drink wine? Another stupid question. Okay, they're trying to use a small exception to overthrow the rule. 
Not logical. Don't waste time on that. And those foolish and unlearned questions, by the way, will lead to strife. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach. What is logical reasoning? It's teaching. It's you yourself learning something so that you can pass it on to others. That's logical reasoning. Apt to teach, patient, verse 25, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If you are emotional, you're opposing yourself. You're just hurting yourself. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. The truth comes about by logical reasoning. Verse 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You know how Satan snares people? Satan doesn't use truth to snare people. He uses emotion. He uses feelings. That's how the devil can snare people. That's how the majority of professing modern church people, that's how they're snared. That's how they're deceived, by their emotions. The majority of negative comments that I get on my channel are based on emotion, not logic. They're not at all logical. You know, it's all this feelings and oh, how dare you attack me and how dare you attack my favorite preacher and how dare you do this and how dare you do that. Why? I've offended their feelings. I've hurt their feelings. That's not logic. Watch out for people that respond emotionally. Make sure that you yourself do not respond emotionally. Don't get taken in by this modern movement, okay? You need to read the Bible, you need to understand the Bible, and live by it. All right? Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that we are not left down here without a witness, but that we can know absolute truth. We can know what we are supposed to do. And I just pray, Lord, that, that the people out there, as times get worse, as there's more emotion that's interjected into this world, and people fall more and more away from this blessed book, I pray that those Christians out there that are called by thy name, that are, that are true Bible-believing, King James Bible-believing Christians, they would respond out of logical reasoning with the Scriptures as their guide, line upon line, precept upon precept, and that they would not be fooled and brought in by emotion. I just pray all these things, Lord, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That's it.